Recording in progress. All right, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to assemble together to know you more through your word. Your word is rich with doctrines that will enable a believer to live in such a way that the world will wonder how it is that we're doing what we're doing. And so I pray that every time we go through your word, you would help us to notice those details so that we can make adjustments in our personal lives ultimately giving you the honor and glory that rightfully belongs to you. But Father, before we even look into the word or the doctrine that we're going to look at, we'll just pause for a moment of silence and exercise 1 John 1, 9, also known as the rebound technique, to confess any known sin so that we would be filled with the Spirit as per your word. So let's just pause for a moment of silence and then I'll proceed with opening it with prayer and then going into the class. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for giving us this opportunity to examine your word. And I pray now, Lord, as we engage in the doctrines that we're going to look at, uh, that you would help us through the agency of God, the Holy Spirit, to see these truths as revealed in Scripture so that we can make adjustments where necessary. And we ask and pray all of these things through Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let me show you the verse that we're going to look at first. It's taken from John chapter 17, verse 17. I want you to see and recall the impact that the Word of God has on our life. So this is why, one of the many reasons why I put heavy emphasis on the Word. You can see in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus, when speaking, says, when he was praying to the Father, sanctify them by your truth. It's this word hagiadzo, for sanctify, it just means to separate them, put them aside by your truth. And then he goes on to say, your word is truth. So that helps us see that the separation and the moving away is done by the word of truth. So he says, sanctify them by your truth, because your word is truth. Another way of saying it, oh, well, I thought I had another translation, but that's for the next translation. But so focus in on 17. He says to sanctify them by your truth. And the truth ultimately comes from his word. You see it right there in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. And then he goes on to say your word is truth. So the sanctification process is al always involves the truth which ultimately comes from the Word of God, clearly in John 17, 17. So that's the agency, coupled with God the Holy Spirit, to sanctify the individual. We're also told in Psalms 119, 9, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. So notice what it is that helps a young man keep his ways clean. Psalms 119, 19 says it like that. How can a young man cleanse his way? The agency again is according to the word. By taking heed or listening according to your word, your instruction, your doctrine. Another way, another translation renders it like this. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. So within these two verses, we can see that the Word of God has great impact in an individual's life. So he starts off in Psalms by talking about a young person, meaning that it's usually a younger person that can't control themselves. But as we mature, it becomes easier. Not that we get rid of it, but he says, how can a young person stay pure by obeying your Word? So the more we inculcate his word, his truth, 
the sanctifying truth of God's word, then there's the impact that the word of God can have in our soul, in our life, in our being. Which is why it is so important to stick with the word of God, to get into the word of God, to inculcate the word of God, and to recognize that we should not live by food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, which is equated to truth. So with, this is why all the doctrinal teachers see and put heavy emphasis on biblical truth, Bible doctrine as it's often called, because it's in the Word of God, it's in the categorical doctrines that are found throughout the Word of God that can help a person not only keep their way clean or set us apart, set ourselves aside or apart from others in the world, but it empowers us. The Word of God empowers us because it's alive and active, sharper than a, than a two-edged sword. And so we see this in Scripture, and I try to bring this out every so often to remind us that it's all found in the Word of God because it's so easy in this day and age to put the Bible aside and to try to play catch-up, to try to kind of mix with everybody else and try to gel with the, the, our friends who are unregenerate. We're trying to blend in and we're not to blend in at all. We're to impact. We're to impact the people around us with the ultimate objective of pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can have rapport with the Heavenly Father. So they don't know that there's a separation beginning in Genesis 3. And so our job is to make that impact with the Word of God coupled with God the Holy Spirit by our life. And when we live a life that is reflecting Bible doctrine that we have inculcated throughout the years, throughout the months, throughout the days, then it makes it easier for the individual to acquiesce to Jesus Christ because we're taking the time to study these doctrines, to study these words, so that ultimately we're pleasing Him while at the same time planting seeds wherever we go. Today I had an opportunity. I didn't know that the, their confidence in me was as a direct result of seeing and watching the consistency of the doctrines that I've been teaching in this church. A couple <clears throat> called me, well, the husband called me and said, I need help. My marriage is, uh, needs help. Would you be open to speaking to my wife and I? And so I met with them today and I'm fairly new in the church, but yet they, all they saw was how consistent I was with the word. They don't know me from anything. They only know that I'm a pastor. But there was something about the consistency of my life amidst this congregation that allowed them, at least for this couple, to say, hey, can you talk to us? We have confidence in you. That's not their words. I'm just getting that based on what transpired today and they had confidence in me I didn't know and this is the whole thing about impact we must make an impact you never know how people will read you because they're reading you they may not say oh I saw that you you're a Christian I know that notice that you're a Christian they may never ever come up to you and say that but you will leave an impact wherever you go even in the context of church they, you'll never know the person who is next to you, the person that you're teaching. You'll never know what they're going to say and conclude based on your consistency, based on what they see in your life. If you uphold doctrine above all things, they're going to gravitate towards you and say, I'll share my life with you. I need help. This is what's happening in my personal life. And you know what? I somehow I can I believe you and I want to share this with you I want you to help me help me know what to do so 
I'm not saying that you're all going to be counselors or anything like that, but I assure you that when people know that you are consistently steeped in God's Word, consistent with your relationship with God, you're the person, you're the candidate for them to open up and say, hey, help me. It sounds like, it looks like you have things together, even though it may not be perfect, but they will entrust themselves to you. So I was a little surprised. I mean, I'm not surprised if they say, oh, I like the way you executed that passage. I like the way that you taught this, that, and the other. But for them to say, we need help other than the, ta the teachings of the word, that was brought about by a consistency of handling the Word of God and teaching and showing a consistency while we're there in front of them. So if you live a life that's consistent with doctrine, then don't be surprised if people open up to you because it's God that they're seeing in your life. And that's what I want. I'd love for people to see God in you. Emmanuel. God with us. God in us. And that is the natural byproduct of a healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not having that, am I saying that you're not a Christian, that you're, you're substandard? Not at all. I'm just saying, this is what happened to me recently. And I'm actually surprised because it was two people I didn't even think would approach me. I didn't even, I was oblivious to this. So, I share this because of the impact. I've been using the word impact a lot lately. You all are going to make an impact if you're consistent with Bible doctrine, if you're consistent with your intake of God's Word, because they will say, there's something about this individual that makes me want to reach out to him or her because I can't do it anymore. He or she looks like they've got things together. And on the surface, it may look like that, because Math, Jesus t taught us in Matthew 7 when we take his word and we do it. It'll be when the winds, waters, and winds, waters, I lost the, the three elements smacks into the house. They remain standing. They're fortified. They're stable. So they will notice that. There's something about you that is giving off the impression that you're stable. And that's because of your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, coupled with God the Holy Spirit. I thought I'd share that. That's not part of the study, but I think it kind of relates if I, if we really think about the Word of God, the impact that it has. So now we're in the section on ambassadorship. An ambassador does not appoint himself. We are appointed by Christ. We're on page 4 of the Field Manual by Pastor Gene. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-20 talks about this. An ambassador does not support himself. <clears throat> so, God supplies all your needs. And you have to remember that. That you, If you're going to go in full bore and serve God in any capacity... You have to understand that if there's any hesitancy on your part, maybe, I don't know if I could pull this off because I have all these things going on. Well, God will supply all your needs. Everything that you would need to pull it off, God is going to make sure you're going to be able to pull it off. He's not going to dangle a carrot before you and say, jump. He's going to say, if you put him first and he says, put me first above all things and when you sit there and say well I have this that and the other I have to take care of all these things what about this what about that don't you think he knows that don't you think that he's factored all of these things in eternity past before you were even formed and designed he's taken all of that into consideration and said done I've got you I've got you way before you even thought you had this coming. You think you need this and that? You're going to need a lot more than that. In fact, I'm going to make sure it's accounted for. 
because I'm your heavenly father. So I like the fact that Pastor James puts this out here in point number two. An ambassador, um, an ambassador does not support himself. You don't take care of yourself. I mean, the basic stuff, yeah, you got to brush your teeth, you got to eat from time to time, you've, you've got to rest. All of that is factored in. Those are things that we must do for ourselves. But the support system, the things that you need, coverage for anything that you think that you're going to leave behind, no, no, no. He's got that. He's going to make sure it's all covered. You will never fall short or come short when you put God first. Well, I got to make money. I got to do this. Look, we all do. Look at the lives of those who put God first, missionaries and more. You never come up short. When you prioritize God in your life, <clears throat> before I continue, I'm not suggesting that you quit what you're doing, especially if you're working. I'm just saying when you prioritize God in your life, hold on. You're going to be in for a really exciting ride because He's not only going to take care of you, but you're going to see the impact you're going to have when you tag team with God Himself. When, you, when you're going to allow yourself to be used beyond what you've just been doing, oh, hang on. Hang on to your hat because it's going to be the best ride ever. So the author, uh, Pastor Gene, says, an ambassador does not support himself. God does. He takes care of you. All your needs. An ambassador, point number three, is not a citizen of the country where he is sent. We're here on earth. We are citizens of heaven, Philippians 3.20. What's that got to do with being an ambassador? Well, we have to remember we belong to a different locale, a different location. We're taking bits and pieces of heaven, bringing it down here on earth so that it will encourage and even excite the unregenerate so that they would want that heaven that we're showing them in our lives, through our lives, by our actions, by our choice of words. Because as he equips us, as he empowers us, we're really boasting about God. We're glorifying God by our actions. We're saying, look, you have not even tasted the best of the best of the best. You think you're happy now, and yet here you are, you're discouraged and you're depressed. You're trying to find meaning in life, and I'm telling you, I've got this solved already for you. God, for God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son. You're never alone. You don't have to feel discouraged, depressed, down in the dumps. He loves you. Nobody else can love you the way that he does. Nobody else can protect you the way that he does. You may not have an army around your own personal home, but you have the armies of God who is in the spiritual realm who can do far more damage than the armies of the world. And you can't even see them. But he as at he is there waiting, there, there waiting for God himself to say, what should we do now? Should we protect Freddy? Should we go and surround him with our, our army here? God says, wait. Wait till I say go. It's up to God and he sees it all. He, uh, he is there watching. He knows the enemies that are on there trying to attack us. And he says, with pinpoint accuracy, no, not yet. God is, Freddy is trusting me, and he, he's not caving in yet. We don't need to do anything. He's standing in faith, and you know what? He's got this. He's trusting in me. He knows that the devil can't even touch him. He's doing a great job. He's not sweating it. He's not even mad at me. He's not throwing his hands up saying, where are you? He's re faith resting. The stuff that he's been teaching, he's faith resting. He's putting it, he threw it on me. So he's relaxed. He's perfectly fine. He keeps telling everyone that he hasn't stressed out since 1997. Now it's to 2023. So he is living proof that he is honoring his word. So let him. We don't have to throw any armies down there yet. He's doing fine. He's trusting in me. He believes that it will work out. So we have to remember that we are citizens of heaven. We don't belong here. One day we will be in heaven. That's where our true residency is. Heaven. With God. 
Number four, an ambassador has instructions in written form. We have the Bible. We must know what the instructions say. We must know and familiarize ourselves with what the instructions say. I often say, because we have an abbreviated time now, I think time is of the essence. I think we're about to see the rapture anytime soon. I would say focus on Romans to Revelation. I'm not suggesting you can't look at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You can, but I might as well, you might as well ramp up the RPMs and concentrate and focus on Romans to Revelation because that's where the Holy Spirit empowers us to live out the church age promises from Romans on. He won't empower you to keep the Ten Commandments, in other words. He's not going to empower you to kill the animals as a sacrifice. You might be able to learn certain things there, how sovereign he is and how he can part the Red Sea, but he's not going to empower you to do those things in the Old Testament, which is why I, I would suggest dialing in Romans all the way down to Revelation. RR, Romans, Revelation. Know the principles, especially the epistles. Know that you have power, sovereign power, resident in your body, in your life, because of your relationship with God. And that's supreme. That's really exciting. So, number five, an ambassador cannot take insults personally. Well, you know, when an ambassador represents USA, for example, and they go to Middle East or another foreign country, a lot of times they look at that ambassador and they mock the ambassador and say, oh, that American, that USA, they're weak. Because they're looking at America in general, but they look at the ambassador and they mock the ambassador and they say things, you people, you people, you Americans, you don't know what you're doing. So we, the ambassador can't take that personally. He knows that he represents America, but he can't take that personally because he knows that the insults are really towards the country he represents. And so likewise, when people mock us, we have to remember they're really mocking our Lord and Savior. And ultimately, it's not you that they hate, it's Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we get caught up, oh, well, they hurt my feelings. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. It's so hard. Ah. God tells us, if they hate me, they will hate you too. So don't think that you were not prepared in advance. He's already told us in his word. And the written instructions tell us these things. So if you don't know this, then familiarize yourself with the key doctrines that will relate to that so that you won't be surprised anymore. And he even told us that even your own family will be divided. If you choose me over your family, they're going to be upset at you. But I didn't come, didn't come to make you guys closer. I came to divide you. Came to set a sword among your family members. So all of these things are as a direct result of consistent study and intake of his word. And if you're not doing that, you're not, this not, will not make sense. I'm just spouting out the things that I know to be true, kind of giving you an accelerated discipleship program as we're looking at this ambassadorship section in the field manual. So you can't take insults personally. He is accepted or rejected, not on his own merit, but because of who he represents, is what I just said. We are not to take it personally when we're despised and rejected by those who hate Jesus. John 15, 19 to 21. <clears throat> An ambassador, point number six, does not enter a country to profit himself. We are here on earth to serve the Lord. It's him we're serving. We're not here to profit ourselves. We're not here to make as much as we can. Now, I'm not opposed to that. Again, if you are going to make millions, remember we're friends, right? <laughs> Don't forget me. I'm not saying you can't make a million bucks or you can't earn a good living I'm just saying our priority our scale of value should be on God first that's our focus it should be our focus and so we're not here to just think of ourselves we're here to think about him who gave it all so when we have that mindset the material things will be reduced 
Okay, we won't think it as, a, as much as, as we think of the heavenly treasures. We have to think of God first. We're on earth to serve the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5.15, and that has to be the backbone to why we do what we do. Number seven, an ambassador is a personal representative of someone else, not ourselves, not our families, but someone else. Everything he or she does, says, reflects on the one who sent him. So we are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ by action as well as by word. So basically what you do, what you say, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. So they see Jesus Christ by your life, by what you say, by what you don't say, by what you do, what you don't do. So don't think it's just, oh, you're not murdering anybody, so therefore I'm okay. No. What about your thoughts? What about your words? If they see you laughing at an um, X-rated joke, they see that. That's that's a poor representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all those things add up as a personal representative of Jesus Christ. You are his representative, and that is very uh, a very big responsibility on behalf of Christ himself. So we must live a life of holiness and godliness. So this isn't to prove that you're saved, but this is to prove that you are truly an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have to be at your best at all times because he's worthy. So this is where the obedience, the aligning your will with his will starts to shine. We've covered throughout the year the importance of salvation by faith alone and Christ alone. All you do is believe, right? But now ambassadorship, discipleship is based on your obedience your compliance with sound doctrine. So we have to ramp that up now. We have to make sure what we say, what we don't say, what we do, what we don't do, lines up with His Word. If it doesn't, we're a poor representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, there will be disciplining, the disciplining hand of God in our life as a result of that, because that would, that would be sin. Point number, we are representative of the Lord. Number eight, an ambassador's perspective is service. His prospect is reward. We are commissioned for, top of page five, service and will be rewarded. Matthew 5, 12, 2 John 1, 8, Revelation 22, 12. Available people. So now he's going to give an example of people in the past who were available and what they did. Moses, for example, Numbers 12, 3, Hebrews 11, 25 to 26. To Moses, availability meant self-denial and great hardship to accomplish the plan of God. So if you know anything about how Moses was used, it's phenomenal. The major sacrifice on his part. He could have lived it up and lived with uh, luxury and money and power, but he chose to be with God instead. That's an excellent person to study if, if you ever want to see the life of someone who gave it all just to be a representative of God. Then you have David, 2 Samuel 16, 11. 1 Samuel 16, 13, and 17, 37. The battle with Goliath is probably the most famous of all. There was only one person available for the fight, David. What made David so great for the fight? <clears throat> well, the fact that he stepped out of a multitude of warriors, warriors and said, I'll be the one. Any other person could have stepped forward and accomplished this task, but David made the voluntary decision to be available. And I know in the past we've looked at the choice words that he used when confronting Goliath. His words were so telling. You, have, you don't stand the chance. And this, Goliath was laughing. You send me a little lad? And, but his words were very revealing and telling. He said, you have no chance, David speaking, to go against the armies of God. So in his mind, 
he was supported his backup support was the armies of God you have you have no chance you stand no chance against the armies of God so this young man was going forward to fight Goliath and he knew that the armies of God was there right be in by his side and running in front to help take care of Goliath and then in the end he slaughtered the uh, Goliath's head with his own sword phenomenal victory from a young boy who had no training I mean his only training was a, a sling a slingshot and yet he was confident in being able to t go up against Goliath who stood nine foot tall I mean someone who wasn't trained he was just a shepherd boy and yet he, his 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 confidence was in the past he's killed a bear and he you know he uses all these examples in life he said he doesn't stand a chance but then he says you don't stand a chance against the armies of God and I think that we if we draw from the word and we see all these examples of saints from before or believers from before we should we should have utmost confidence when we go face our troubles whether it's Moses whether it's Noah whether it's David, we should be able to look at these stories and say, well, if it happened to them and they have great impact and they won, the victory was on their side, why in the world would I be worried? Why should I sweat this out? Because these stories are there for us to know how God is trustworthy, how faithful He is, how sovereign He is. So when we study the Bible, it shouldn't be, well, I want to do the right thing because it's the Christian thing. It's, you, you know, I don't want to let my wife down, my husband down. We, I, we're Christians. I don't want the people at church to think, well, if I don't know these stories, then I might not be a really good Christian. No, they're there for you to want to know so that for your own personal use, you can default to these stories and say, maybe I didn't have the same experiences as Noah, Moses, David. But you know what? Did they take place? Were they recorded for my edification? Yes, the scripture says it's for our own benefit. It's for us to study and know. Why? So that maybe you don't have a David kind of story. Maybe you don't have a Moses kind of story or a Noah kind of story. But those did happen. Those actually happened in the past for our edification so that when we're going through difficulty we can say well what did God do in the past is he capable of doing this for me today of course he is imagine being there during that time I mean it must have been an awesome sight to see to behold and then what how would we com communicate that forward how would we advance that forward so that the people down the road we'll know how awesome God is well it's what we have in scripture we would probably be doing the same thing it would be recorded for others in the future to know so that if you're David if you're Noah if you're Moses you want this recorded and you want other people to know how sovereign how awesome and how faithful God is so that they can trust in Yahweh they can trust in the Messiah there will be a Messiah, just wait. And then the Messiah came. So now what more? We have much more than they. Yes, they saw the living God. But we have the living God in us, indwelling in us. So the studying of God's word has a myriad of benefits so that we can live, so that as we close out, the end times we're going to be able to impact people before the tribulation occurs before all this happens we're going to be able to rescue people who they don't even they're oblivious to what we're doing and what we believe in so they're counting on us as ambassadors God's counting on us as ambassadors so now going on we have Elijah Number three on the bottom of page five. Elijah is considered by many the greatest prophets of the Jews. 
What made him great? He followed instructions. Can we follow instructions? Where do we get our instructions? Elijah heard God. We heard God. We hear God through the written word of God. The word of God is recorded for us so that we can follow the instructions. So what made him great? He followed instructions. God told him to go to the brook Cherith, and he went to the brook Cherith. God told him to go to Zarephath. He went to Zarephath. No argument. He didn't complain. He just obeyed. He was available. So these three on page five, Moses, David, and Elijah, they obeyed. Are you going to be the next available person? And then Isaiah, in Isaiah 6 a top of page 6, the greatest statement of Isaiah's availability was so simple. Here am I, send me. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying my best. Keep saying, Lord, send me. Send me. And he did send me, and here I am. So what it, where is he, is he going to send you? Have you made yourself available? Like Isaiah, send me. When was the last time you said, send me? Maybe he can send you to your friends, your family members. Have you been receptive to his, his call, his nudging? Please do. Number five, Esther. Uh, Esther 4.16. Esther was one of the great ladies of the Old Testament. She faced something that could have meant her death. And she said, if I perish, I perish. She chose to be available. If I die, I die, in other words. A rough translation. If I die... I die. She didn't care. Esther 4, 6. Mary, uh, Luke 1, 38. When Mary was told that she, a virgin, <clears throat> would bear a child, she said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it to, done to me according to your word. She would, have, she would face slander and maligning, but she was willing to pay the price. Didn't matter. Her words there are very revealing. Behold the bond servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to you. Whatever you want, let it be done. She was willing to pay the price. She did nothing wrong. She was a virgin and now she was going to face ridicule and mocking and possibly lose her fiancé's commitment, her marriage to her fiancé, Joseph. But she was ready. She said, well, let it be done. They won't understand me. That's okay. I'm your bond servant. Your will be done. Have you ever thought that way? Have you ever acted that way? In that manner, whatever. What, your will be done, Father. It may not, I don't, they may not understand it. He may not understand it. She may not understand it. But I know between you and I, that's your will. And I believe that you will provide, you will take care of my need. That in spite of the, those people who will not understand me, you will take me through this and you're going to be by my side. And there's nothing greater than that. As long as I know you're there by my side, whether they understand it or not, so be it. I'm your bond servant. I'm your servant. I'm with you. Lord, may your will be done. I'm your servant, so let it be done. Let it be done. Paul, 2 Timothy 4, 16. Though at his last trial, everyone deserted him. Have you ever been deserted before? Everyone deserted him. Paul remained available to God. Everyone left him. He still was available to God. Throughout his ministry, Paul had poured out his life, everything that he's done, all for God. He's poured out his life for the people to whom he took the gospel. So he gave the gospel and he gave his all. He gave his all and yet they abandoned him. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 And because all along the line he had made decisions for service, he knew at the end that his reward was waiting. So sometimes people will bail on you at the last minute. You've done so much for them. You gave them the gospel. And you know what? They'll just run. They'll leave. They'll abandon you for whatever reason. But like Paul, 
throughout his ministry, he poured out his life for the people to whom he took the gospel. So he, basically, he spent time with these people he shared the gospel with, but they abandoned him. And because all along the line he had made, the decisions for service, God first, he knew at the end that the reward was waiting. In other words, that even though the people he shared the gospel with would abandon him, there was an, a, a, war, a reward waiting for him for his service to the Lord. And so likewise, maybe in your own household, your own family, your own friends, your own church, maybe they have abandoned you. That sometimes happens. And when that's the case, like Paul, there will be a reward waiting for you at the end. So if you hold the line and you remain steadfast, there is a reward for you. Isn't that wonderful? Raw material, bottom of page six. A five pound bag of iron made into horseshoe nails is worth $5.50. Made into needles, it is worth $3,000. Made into mainsprings for watches, it is worth 250000 top of page seven. We are raw materials in the hands of God. What will be our worth in heaven? The answer depends on how much refining we allow God to do in our lives on earth. In other words, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to allow God to do with your life? That's the bottom line. Mainspring, uh, needles, nails, horseshoes for a horse. Are you willing to use you? Well, the value of your life depends on your willingness. Are you willing to let him use you? Are you willing to be that ambassador? that we're learning thus far. Now he goes on to Biblical Spirituality, page 7. Uh, the middle of 7. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Number 1. At the moment of salvation, there's that word salvation again, God the Holy Spirit indwells the body of the believer in Jesus Christ. You find this in Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Two power systems reside inside, inside every believer. Power of the flesh, which is the sin nature, and the power of the Spirit of God, Romans 7, 17, and 7, 23, 15, 3. So two power sources inside the believer. The option and objective of the spiritual life is to voluntarily choose not to live in the energy of the flesh or the sin nature, but in the power of the Spirit, Romans 8, 4 to 8. This is a decision to live by faith, not by sight. Faith. There are four major commands in Scripture concerning, concerning the spiritual life. First, be filled with the Spirit, found in Ephesians 5.18. This is the life of study in God's Word, John 16.13. Obedience and fellowship, 1 John 1.7. And confession and correction when we sin. So we first John 1 9, 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one. So we confess the sin, make adjustment, alter the course. Don't just say, Oh, I'm gonna confess it and now Monday I'll do it again. No, no, no. You confess it, undo the grieving, and make adjustments so that you won't do that habitually. Will you still have the tension and the struggle? Of course. You still have the sin nature, you still have the flesh in you. But change course. Turn the video, turn the DVD off. Change the channel. Whatever you can do, confess it, move on. That's what the author, I think, is saying. Top of page 8. Grieve not the spirit. Ephesians 4.30. The context shows that the personal sins grieve the spirit, thus breaking fellowship with God. And then the sin nature is in control or influence. Now the sin nature is influencing you because fellowship has been severed, severed. So again, confession and correction are necessary. So you confess the sin, change course. So if you are struggling with something, like let's say you're an alcoholic and you're trying to remedy that, you're trying to fix it, confess the sin, get out of the bar. Put that bottle down. Conf first confess it, you're, you you remove the grieving of the spirit. Now get out of the bar. Close, chuck the bottle, go get out of there. 
don't sit there and say, oh, I'm so, I'm so weak. Oh, I'm so weak. Oh, that's good. No. Confess it. Lord, that was wrong. I know I shouldn't be here. I'm going to exit the bar. Father, thank you for allowing me to realize that it is possible there is no temptation so great that there is no escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So thank you, Father, for allowing me to confess it. Now I have the power because the, the spirit is no longer grieved. I'm exiting the door. But if you're saying, oh my gosh, this is, I'm only human. Bartender, give me another hit. Another bottle, please. Oh, Lord, I'm so weak. That's not the time to wrestle with it because you're already in the sin. Stop what you're doing. Recognize it. Confess it. As you confess it, then you're going to instantaneously undo the grieving of the spirit. That's the time to change course and walk out of the bar. Don't sit there and say, well, you know, I already justified. Oh, I already spent 10 bucks for this glass, so I might as well finish it because it's a waste. No, don't try to justify it. Father, it was wrong. I shouldn't be here. I'm just going to spend all my money in the bar. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for cleansing me. <sighs> okay, I know it's wrong. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to recognize this, this area of weakness and then walk out of there. Because if you sit there, you're going to justify why you're in this. And, oh, I'm only human. Oh, this, that, and the other. Confess it and watch what happens. That's the time you'll have a surge of power. That's the time your feet are going to follow your thought patterns. Change your thought patterns after 1 John 1 9 and watch how much easier it is to walk away from sin. Will that be permanent? No, 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 it won't be. But what that will do, it will allow you to keep short accounts with God. The sin, the sinful tendency will start to diminish over time as your spiritual life and maturity rises up. So this is why the inculcation of Bible doctrine and God's Word is so important. Not just reading a book and just, oh well, you know, understand the Bible in 90 days. No. Get into what's alive and powerful. It's God's Word. You can read books that will drive you closer to the Word like what we're doing here, but this is dense. There's a lot of good things here in just such a small book. And I'm only consulting and using the books that will contribute to your spiritual maturity and growth. Because you're not gonna get this in just some book from a Christian bookstore. These are, very, these are specifically selected for those who are going to study with me. Because as I'm teaching you, I'm refreshing my mind and I'm recalling and remembering the things that I've studied in the past through my seminary days and throughout my 30 plus years of being a pastor. So this stuff works. I, I, I know it. Because this is the doctrines that I'm very, very familiar with and I want you to as well. So now he goes from grieving not the spirit. Again, confession and correction are necessary. The bottom uh, on letter B, now six, or C is quench not the spirit 1st Thessalonians 5 19 so you've got the two negatives don't grieve the spirit don't quench the spirit quench not the spirit grieve not the spirit quenching now here the context suggests that the spirit is quenched by sins of omission so you know to do you're supposed to do something but you don't so that's the sins of omission so you're supposed to help someone but you ignore it sin of commission is when you purposely violate the word of God. You know, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, but you do it anyway. You commit sins of commission. You commit it. Sins of omission, you in, you refrain. You know to do good, but you don't. You don't take care of the breath. You, go, you don't want to go to church because whatever. So that's sin of omission. You know you should be at church, but you don't. You know you should be praying, but you don't. That's sin of omission. Sin of commission, commit, commit. So that's the differences between the two. So the context suggests that the spirit is quenched by, quenched by sins of omission. Neglect of spiritual disciplines, apathy towards spiritual responsibilities, 
and he says, compare it with 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. Then we're told to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, Galatians 4, 25. Walking in the Spirit is the maintenance of fellowship in the Spirit. <clears throat> I'm sorry, walking in the Spirit is the maintenance of fellowship with God. Persistent. <coughs> Excuse me. Got to get my alcohol now. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> oh, got a tickle in my throat. So, sorry. <clears throat> so, walking in the Spirit is the maintenance of fellowship with God, persistence in the filling of the Spirit, and this is also called walking in the light. First John one seven. Walking in the Spirit will result in consistent spiritual growth. So again, the aim for what I'm trying to accomplish with you all is spiritual growth. Ephesians 2.14-19, 2 Second Peter 1, 5 through 7, 1 Peter 3.18. The evidence of walking in the Spirit will be increasing spiritual fruit in the believer's life. Galatians 5.22-23, 1 Corinthians 13, 4-8. The spiritual life is a life of abiding in Christ remaining in Christ. Remember, it's that Greek word, meno. Remaining, staying in Christ. And it's marked by study, effective prayer, productivity, joy, and love. So, <clears throat> that's it for our study. See, it didn't even, we didn't even, we have 10 minutes left for our, any questions that you might have. Maybe you won't, maybe you will. So let me turn, shut this off here so that you can see me and I can see you. Anybody have any thoughts, comments, or questions? Just unmute your mic and I'll try my best to... Oh, Kathy's there, Sarah's there, Winston, very good. Anybody, you guys like the, this section here? Any thoughts, comments? What do you think? See if anybody has. We've got 14 people. Hi, Nanita. See you there. Good study. What's that? I said hi, Pastor. Hello, Nanita. Hi. So, uh, the difference between the quenching. Mm -hmm. and the grieving of the spirit mm -hmm. can you explain that again i didn't catch it sure i i would i would say grieving is a moments of a moment of sin it could be a word it could be a thought you commit the sin it's instantaneous it's instant whereas quenching is you continue to suppress or douse that you're rejecting the holy spirit's lead so for example He's nudging you to do something, but you are resisting him. And so you're putting out the flames. You're putting out the fire because you're resisting and suppressing the truth in your life. So I would see the difference. And you're living in ongoing sin with quenching. Grieving can take place instantly. Quenching as you continue to live in reversionism or rebellion. That's how I would distinguish the two. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, Nanita. Anybody else have any thoughts, comments, questions? There's something. Yeah, what's the begin beginning of the of the study? Uh huh. Um. Matthew 6.33 came to mind when mm -hmm. you said um, God will take care of everything. Mm -hmm. Like Pastor Jean said, um, we're being supported. Right. That's good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, because, because if we just seek first the kingdom of God, everything else will, and His righteousness. Yeah. Everything else will come to place. I'm not. Yeah. 
you're I'm saying, not saying like, the a com- complete verse, but yeah, something like that. You're right. That's the Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You're yeah. right. That, that does line up with what Pastor Gene said. So we can trust in Him. We can put Him first. I mean, that's the mandate. Seek Him first and His righteousness. And we, when we represent Him, when we collectively pull from all the verses that talk about representing Him, living for Him, being a disciple of His abiding in his word, bearing much fruit, then he will take care of you. We have nothing to worry about. We sometimes worry about these things when in fact he said, no, you don't have to worry. I'm going to take care of all of that. Just give me a chance to prove to you that you can trust me. All these other guys in the past trusted me and it's recorded for your edification. Give me a chance to show you that I am sovereign. And I can take care of you. And I can. So if we know these truths, then we'll sit there and pause and say, Well, was he faithful? Yeah, he he was. Was he sovereign? Was he able to split the sea? Yeah. Did he flood the world? Yeah, kind of. Well, when you put all these truths together, then you realize that, hey, he loves me. He's powerful. He can squash me like an ant, but he doesn't. When I let him down, when I fail him, he still extends his grace. And oh my gosh, I'm I'm still alive. I'm still here. He still loves me. So when you take all of this into consideration, and all he asks is that we would prioritize him in all things, then he will work his sovereign sovereignty in your life like never before. But we sometimes fall short because we don't prioritize Him. We have to put Him first above all things, and that means in all things. And so, you know, if this was like work, if your job says, I want you to put everything on hold and prioritize the corporation, put me first, and I'll make sure that you climb up the ladder and you'll have... uh, big bonus by December uh, as we close out the year you will have a super bonus we'll get you a car we'll even get you a home we'll probably go all out to just honey you talk to your family you guys you're gonna have to forgive me but I'm gonna have to spend the next several months uh, at work putting the work first before anything else but then in the end I'll have a new car a new house a big bonus And, you know, I I may even get promoted. We get so excited about things like that. But then, when God says He'll take care of all these things, if we seek Him first and His righteousness, we're not as excited. And so, don't be surprised if we're not having a vibrant, exciting spiritual life because there are certain things that we have to comply with. There are certain things that we have to man up to according to his word we have to prioritize him that means for example for me my family knows this Sundays is all out I might love I might like to do something on my Sundays but you know because I I have uh, I can just go home at 5 p.m. here in Virginia and um, stream on to California and I could easily say, well, you know, um, I'd like to do this, honey, Joshua, but um, that would mean that I would have to compromise and not be ready for church. I won't be ready for church. And yeah, maybe people will understand that because I need to spend time, but I, that's not even in my thinking. In other words, Sundays is all for God at all times because he's my savior. He's my Lord. So... He deserves the best, and I have to act as that, as such. I have to live that out in front of my family so that they know he's a priority in my life. Now, does that mean we won't have time for vacation? Oh, no, no. In fact, we're already talking about a vacation. Um, But I'm just saying, as an example to you all, that I should not have to think like that as... uh, Huh, let me flip a coin and see if, well, maybe if I 
if I don't go today or next Sunday or something like that, that maybe it'd be okay because I'm I deserve time off too. You have to remember when when we talk about uh, when we're studying things like this ambassadorship and priority. He is com- he's committed to us. We should be committed to him, hundred percent. Just like Pastor Gene said, we have to give it our all. There's non-negotiables on certain things. We have to prioritize him at all costs because he's worthy. I mean, if he was in a burning bush and you spoke to him, I assure you, you would not skip out on Bible studies. You would skip out on church, skip out on this or that and the other, prayer time. You would be on your knees. You would be there every single time, every Tuesday, Wednesday, and more because you just had an experience with God. But again, the purpose for the Bible classes is so that you can see that what we're committed to is worth our time. Is God worthy of our best? If so, we must give him our best, not the second best, not the third best. And people will ultimately know if God is first in your list of priorities, your scale of values. Is he a priority? My family knows that he is. Is it because I'm a pastor? No. It has nothing to do with being a pastor. Ever since I became a believer in 1981, I've learned to prioritize him, even if that meant going against my parents, because at the time we were Roman Catholic, and I had to come up with a way of letting my parents know that I need to go to church, I need to go to Bible class, because we were still Catholic at the time. And so I bombarded them with prayers, you know, believe in Christ, John 3.16. But it wasn't as smooth as it, I would like it to be. If I knew what I knew now, I'd approach it differently. But eventually they came to faith. So God um, allowed me to see that, yes, um, if I would trust him in all things, my parents would eventually come to faith, and they did. So I did not back down. I said, I need to go to church. I'll, so I compromised. I'll go to Catholic church, but I need to also go to Christian church. So that's the only way that I was able to go to Christian church because I continued to go to Mass, as it was called. Go to church, Catholic church, and then Christian church. That was the only way that I can go to the Christian church. So all I'm saying is, if God is number one in your life, then live to that. Uh, live up to that truth let people see it because again the people around you are noticing that if the family members your friends do not see that then you're not putting him first your choice your choice the choices that you make will determine whether or not God is a priority to you among your periphery your friends your circle of influence because they know based on the decisions you make so if you have an opportunity to impact the people by the choices that you make, then God, to God be the glory because He is worthy of our best and our first, no matter what, no matter what. Because He sees the choices you and I make every single day and He catalogs those over time. Now, if we choose not to prioritize Him like the prodigal son, there were consequences to the prodigal son. He chose to not be with the father. In other words, he chose not to be prioritize him and the father's directives. He said, I want what belongs to me and I'm getting out of here. And he did. The, the loving father in his omniscience let him go. He said, okay, you don't want to be with me. You don't want to have fellowship with me. You don't want this protection. You don't want the ongoing fellowship? Go. And through a series of events, the son eventually regretted it. And in his mind, he said, oh my God, he's not going to accept me back. I'm here feeding the pigs. In my father's house, I had everything. Every air-conditioned house. I had food. I was taken care of. Now here I am feeding the, the pigs. And I wish I could eat the food off the pigs but that that's embarrassing so the son regretted it and I think that's a image and a 
a message for all of us that when we pull away from God after, after knowing what he has done for us and we decide to give him second best, don't be surprised if you see certain things to close up. Doors close in your own personal life because you basically put him second after he's blessed you. We all have been blessed in many ways, I'm sure. Don't be surprised if doors start closing because that's how God operates. If you don't prioritize God, that's, that's wrong. That's a sin. So it's easy to pray for things when the difficulties are coming. But then we forget about Him when things are fine and stable. We, we realize that, oh, we forget that, you know, like the ten lepers... They were all healed, remember? But only one of them came back to give thanks. And Jesus said, where are the rest of the guys that I healed? Isn't, wasn't there more than just you? Did they forget so quickly what I did for them? Because back then, leprosy is, you go down the street, you have to say, unclean, unclean, to let, to let the others know that you have leprosy. And that's the kind of life that they lived uh, they had to go through the embarrassment. They'd have to step on the other side of the other side so as people were coming or they would step to the other side so they won't cross paths and get, possibly get contaminated with the leprosy. And they lived like that and Jesus Christ healed them. And he said, you're fine now. And nine of them forgot their past, what he has done for them. They were so quick to forget him. I'm happy now, I can be with my family and let's go party. And they forgot the person who redeemed them, spared them from that problem. They didn't even give thanks. They didn't even, fo they didn't even decide to follow him and listen to his teachings. We don't know the reasons, but Jesus obviously thought there should have been the others who came back. And we're so quick to say, oh, if I was a leper, I'd go give thanks, really? Remember, when we don't prioritize him, we're just as guilty as saying, ah, let's go. Now that I'm free from leprosy, let's go have fun. We're just as guilty. I say that because I want all of you to recognize that God must be number one in your life. Prioritize him. I'm only going to give you the best of the best of the best as we're spending time together. Sometimes I may step on feet, not, in, not to hurt your feelings, but to, to give God the glory and to prioritize Him means sometimes I'll say things that might be taken the wrong way, but my intention is not to affect or hurt or make you mad, but to let you know that we're dealing with a sovereign God who deserves our best at all times. Okay? Thoughts, comments, questions before we close in prayer? I just want to say something. Sure, Rudy. Really. Sure. Um, you know, I just, when you were talking, mm -hmm. I saw the difference because I, I, uh, I, uh, I had a sharing with, uh, with, when is it, uh, Thursday something? Yeah. Or Friday with all the pastor. And I said to them that we have to understand that we talk 99% and there's one nothing. So how do we correct it? Now I saw that with you, you're, you're teaching the 100%. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I imagine that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is in our present, and God is in the present. Yeah. So I, I, I'm trying to analyze what I have said to those pastors. Mm -hmm. And now it is more clearly to me mm -hmm. that I ask them how do we correct it right. and and they, they didn't say anything and uh, to me my my thinking in that moment is we're not in the presence of the Holy Spirit because you cannot answer how to correct it and I was pointing out that I think we should humble ourselves and correct it mm. and these people that we taught will go out 99%. Mm -hmm. One thing is missed. My comparison is 
what I saw now is really clarify what my understanding mm. about teaching it the right way. That's good. Yeah. Very and good. now I'm, I'm confident to I'm not challenging them, I'm just pointing out to them that mm -hmm. we have to correct it. And I said, you know, it's a, I think the problem is you were brought up that way and that's the way you taught it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so right. They were all quiet. Hmm. You know, and then what's so amazing about it, one of the pastors shut me down. And I said, I see the point? I haven't finished the example that I'm going to say that we are lacking in teaching the Bible, the Word of God. Mm. And you shut me down. I think this is the most uh, thing that um, when you get offended, or if you get offended, or your pride comes in, and you're more knowledgeable than me. I said, I am not a pastor. You are the pastors. Right. Yeah. And I saw the difference now when I was listening to you, mm -hmm. and it really made it clear to me that I the word of God is correct through you, through what you said. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rudy. Well, you know that's why I'm imparting all of this to you all because I don't want to be I don't want to be known as the correct one. I want everyone to know that the Bible is correct and so if we handle it correctly and we disperse it to others we're making disciples of all nations all people so that's the mandate in Matthew 28 we're to make disciples of all people and so as I teach you the word you become accountable to the word and so therefore you must now teach it to other people so as you are growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, it's edifying your soul, it's edifying you, it's empowering you, you're having a boldness and a, a renovation as per Romans 12 too. And so now you will slowly but surely be able to share with confidence because it's the word of God that is transforming you through the agency of God the Holy Spirit so that you won't live for just yourself. You're going to have that spark of wanting to share it with other people. You're going to say, you know what? The Bible is not really so dull. It's just the way that we approached it in the very beginning. You know, we were probably grew up in a church where maybe kind of like teachers in school we didn't like the way the teacher taught, and so we would switch teachers in college or something. They'd say, I don't like the way the teach that teacher is so boring and dry. And so you learn from another teacher, you learn from a different pastor, and so it now starts to come alive. And once it comes alive, the word's still the same, but it's just that for whatever reason, um, whether it's me or someone else, they have a way of communicating it so that now it takes on new meaning, new life, and now you're sitting there saying, wow, the Word of God really is awesome, and I like Pastor Freddy. Well, it's not really Pastor Freddy that you like. It's the Word of God that you're enjoying, because now it's taking on meaning. You're able to understand it. Maybe your previous pastor, or like what Rudy was saying, they're not teaching the Bible, or you know, they're shutting you down because maybe you're sharing something that it's convicting them and I've like I've said before I know Rudy you know this for a fact I'm not saying to be combative and I I've, I've never sensed that you're combative you you've got a very gentle spirit about you I know that you're there to listen to other pastors and listen to what they're saying and I think there's a special place that you have with these Filipino pastors and so as you're growing in doctrine and as you're growing in the word then as you interact with other people you now are starting to see the differences and so you when the Holy Spirit leads you you can certainly share certain truths and you know you're not trying to say oh you're wrong you do this but when you're sharing the truth and they're closing you you're closing your microphone 
I don't know what to say about that, but I know that you're not trying to be argumentative, but you have a responsibility to yourself, to your wife, and the people that you talk to, to share what God has been revealing to you through our studies as you're growing, and as well as everybody else, be it Namita, Rod, Rudy, Steve and Karen, Susanna, Winston, Jasmine, and all those, Sarah, Arnie, Gladys, all of you who are learning these things, now you become responsible for this truth that has been imparted to you. So now you have to take these things and say, okay, what did I learn? How can I apply this in my life? And once you see how it's applicable to your life, then you do it. And if not, then God says, well, why not? Why are you not doing this? I'm using this as a an opportunity to get your attention so that you'll be more proactive in doing what you're being taught so that you're not just going to sit there and not do anything you're there to learn so that you will be no longer the same person you were from yesterday it's slow changes over time with the goal of growing in maturity and spiritual growth because the answer to sin is spiritual growth and maturity. Remember that. If you're struggling with any kind of sin, we all struggle, right? The answer to sin is growth and maturity. So as you grow and mature, that will deal with the sin issue, the wild nature that's in us. That will help curb and control the sin nature. It won't eradicate the sin nature, but now you're bolstering the new man that's in you. So when they arm wrestle, the new man is gaining in strength as you grow and mature and you stand a greater chance over time because you're growing the new man that's in you, the new creation that's in you. But you can't grow apart from maturity or God's word. You must have in doctrine inculcated in your soul. That is what I'm attempting to do so that you'll discover that yes the sin issue is decreasing over time and the frequency is decreasing over time and you're able to stem all that because of not your willpower but because of the new man that's in you. You walk by means of the spirit and you will not be controlled by the flesh anymore. Walk by means of the Spirit and you'll be able to see a new power, a new life, a new you like you've never seen before. Not because you're becoming stronger, but because you're becoming more mature. Your spiritual growth is going this way and the frequency of sin is going the opposite direction. It's going down. So you will never, ever, ever lose the sin nature, but you can certainly become stronger over time. And that is the issue, that's the solution to the sin issue. And every Christian, including myself, wrestles with the sin nature. I'm not perfect. I still sin. I still struggle. But I can tell you, the amount of times that it hits me is decreasing over time. And it becomes a little easier for me to get the upper hand as I'm growing spiritually and, and maturing. So I still have a ways to go. But I'm going in that direction. I'm following that trend because it, I'm recognizing that I still struggle. I'm still sinning. But I'm noticing that it's becoming less and less pronounced because I'm fortifying my soul with Bible doctrine. And if you fortify your soul with Bible doctrine and you commit to the inculcation on a consistent basis, I assure you, you'll be able to see what the Word of God says in Romans 12 2 and other places that it is possible to see a much more pronounced spiritual walk where you can say it is possible I'm not sinless but I am sinning less because not because of my own physical strength not because I have great willpower but because God the Holy Spirit coupled with the Word of God which is transforming me and you over time as you commit to the consistency of Bible doctrine over time. Because if you're not experiencing that, then you have not prioritized it. Because I assure you that 
if you notice that the sin issue is not decreasing over time, you're not growing. And I don't say that in a boastful way. I, I'm still sinning myself. But there should be a commensurate decrease with sin as you're increasing with spiritual growth and maturity. So if you have a pattern, if you see a, a line going up this way, your spiritual growth and maturity is going this way, then over time you should see that the sin issue is becoming less pronounced because you're, it's being surpassed by the power that comes from growth and maturity. So that's the issue to sin, growth and maturity. But the people who struggle the most, and this is where we'll close, the people struggling the most because they have sin issues, they're beset with all kinds of things, they're confused about their, their self, their life, uh, who they are, what's the meaning of life. Those are the ones who don't have much of God. They're a practical atheist, meaning they don't commit to God, they don't believe in Him, but the ones who are having a, a, a stable life, regardless of what's going on around the world, more than likely, I would say that they're grounded in the Word, grounded in the relationship with Christ, grounded and empowered by God the Holy Spirit. It's not a mystical power, it's a reality that comes from God Himself. But you will not experience that if God is not the top priority of your scale of values. So if you put Him first and you commit to an ongoing consistency with sound doctrine, that's the only way you're going to be able to experience it. Because if you're not experiencing it, then you're not putting Him as a high priority and you're not getting the doctrine that you need to stave off the sin issue that we all struggle with, including myself. So having said that, I will close in prayer and we'll meet tomorrow for those of you are, who are also joining the Wednesday night class so you can get more doctrine. So let's pray. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to know you more each and every week. Some of us are studying twice a week, some of us three times a week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday. And Father, we know that, that even that's not enough. So hopefully everybody that's studying on this Tuesday night and Wednesday night are supplementing it with uh, some Thursdays and Fridays studies so that they will have a consistent uh, routine in the intake of your word. Because it's the intake of your word that does the transformation according to Romans 12 too. Don't be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. And so Father, I care for every person on this study. I, I love them all and I hope and trust that they prioritize you to the fullest so that they can experience the grace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that surpasses all understanding, and then the empowerment that comes only through the Word coupled with God the Holy Spirit. And so I pray, Lord, that you would keep every person on this study and those who listen to this online via our website or YouTube channel, that you would allow them to prioritize you above all things, including family, because we know that you are worthy of, of our best. And so, Father, may the, this word and recording go to the highways and byways so that your name would be honored and elevated above all things. And we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Thank you Pastor. Bye, Susanna. Bye, Bye, Lord. Bye, Winston. Bye, Bye. Bye.